Welcome to the Faith Bridge Sermons Podcast. Today's sermon is brought to you by Bible teacher Scott Pollock and was recorded on Sunday, June 18th, 2023. And hey, if you're ever in the area, join us on Sunday on campus at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. and come say hi in person. You could also follow us on Instagram at, at FaithBridge to see what goes on during the week. And as always, you can join us every Sunday for our online service called Faith Bridge Live at faithbridge.org slash live. Here's Scott. Oh, it's so good to see you. Happy Father's Day. My name is Scott. It's a pleasure to be with you again. I uh, hope today is great for all of you. Uh, I know today can be hard for some, but I still hope it's great. Uh, let's pray together again, and then we're going to jump in our scripture. We've got some beautiful work to do in the scriptures together. Let's pray. Would you pray with me? Father, we bless you. We want to begin with gratitude this morning. Interest uh, feebly, I know, but try to call to mind all of the many blessings that you have given us and say thank you. Some of us in this room have not grown up with great fathers. Some of us had excellent fathers. Some of us struggle being a father now. Um, and there's a lot of pain when it comes to fatherhood. But you, God, are good. You are a good father. You love us. You invite us to pray to you as father. You call us daughter and son. And we thank you, God. We bless you this morning. And we say we need you to speak into our lives as a father would, to speak kindness and conviction, to speak comfort and holiness, to call us um, to convict. And so, God, we ask that you would speak through your word, your living word, and your spirit in us, and that you would change us to be more like your son, Jesus. Don't just educate us. Don't entertain us. We reject all of those false and lower goals. We're not here to be socially connected or check off some religious box to make you like us more. No, none of those things are true or good. We're here to be changed by you, to look more and think more and act more like your son Jesus because of your work in our life. So that's what we pray. Let me give you an opportunity wherever you're tuning in to ask God to speak to you this morning, ask God to change you. Maybe you could extend that prayer to someone around you, ask God to speak to them. And humbly, I would ask that you would say a prayer for me, that God would speak through me, and that it would be clear and true. Father, we love you. We bless you. We trust you. We need you this morning. We're desperate for you, so speak now and change us. Let us see your glory and beauty. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, again, it's so good to be with you. If you need a Bible this morning, would you raise your hand? We got a team of our great ushers that are coming by. I'd love to give you a Bible to either borrow or keep. If you don't have one yourself, we would love to give you this one as a gift. Just raise your hand and they'd be happy to loan you one. In high school, I was the biggest poser you probably would have ever met. Sad to say, but it's true. I've accepted it. Um, I have always been tall, have always been skinny at parts of my life, scarily so, but um, that does not compute to any sort of athletic ability, especially on the basketball court. Now, basketball is my sport. I love watching it, and I grew up in the greatest era of basketball, watching on TV sitting down in front of the tube um, with the foil on the antennas, yes, um, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, and of course, Michael Jordan. That's the era I grew up in and wanted to be like them. I mean, the commercial said, be like Mike. I wanted to be like Mike. And so when I got to high school, um, my graduating class was 22 people. So uh, there wasn't a lot of competition to make the basketball team, all right? So they just looked at me and said, yeah, you're in. You're alive, you're in, okay? And so, um, but even as a senior, six foot two, uh, six foot three or something, very skinny, I'm not gonna give you my weight, I was not good enough to sort of play very much. But I acted the part. In fact, um, I had found Michael Jordan's knee brace at like an academy in San Antonio. He played for the Bulls, and so his knee brace, because he actually played and had a slight injury, it, it was black, it had a hole for the kneecap, and on the inside it was red, and he would roll the top of it down, so it was just red at the top, black, and so I bought that, put it on, no knee problems at all, 
um, put it on and wore it on the bench, um, our team colors were blue and white. But that's just, that's just what I did, all right? Uh, I wanted to be like Mike, total poser. There's a very big difference between pretending and being, right? Very big difference between pretending and being. And I, I got to just confess, I think for many years, um, I've walked in more pretending than being, especially even as a follower of Jesus, as a member of the church. Um, not always malignant pretending. It's not like I'm trying to be a pretender, but I have grown to want and long for so much more actual being. And that's what I'd love to talk to you about today in a very peculiar text in, in the book of Acts. So it is a bit of a transitional text, a summary text. And if you're reading through the book of Acts, you may just kind of rush through this section. We're not going to rush through it because we're going to dig a little bit beneath the surface. And just beneath the surface, we're going to see some beautiful gems in this text. So if you've got your Bible, we'll be in Acts chapter 11, the very end of Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19 all the way through the end. So you can open up to Acts 11. Um, and as you get there, um, again, what we're going to see in this text is a couple of things. Um, we're going to visit a brand new city that will become a very important city for the whole rest of the book and the rest of the New Testament. We're going to renew an old friendship, a guy that we met before in chapters 4 and 9. And uh, we're going to see a great need of the church that actually becomes a subplot for the rest of the book of Acts. So all of those are important, but together we're going to try to combine them and embrace them all to see what God might have for us as the church today, right here, Faith Bridge, Spring, Texas, in our year and our time, um, and hope that he allows us to be more than to just pretend. Sound good? Acts chapter 11, that's where we'll be starting in verse 19 through the end of the chapter. I'm going to read from the New American Standard Bible because that's just the one I've marked up and memorized and worked um, to, not memorize the whole Bible, please don't misunderstand, I'm not that good, uh, but memorize sections of it, it's the one I used in seminary and I just know it, I'm familiar with it, um, I'm sure your Bibles can follow along. New American Standard, uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. You see, this is a, a text that's sort of in between a, a beautiful narrative and a coming narrative. It's transitional. It's a bit of a summary text, and we would just read through it. It's like it's tying up this bow, it's dotting that I, it's crossing this T, and now we move on, right? But we're not going to do that. We're not going to rush because there's some beautiful things. I don't know if you noticed the beginning of our text, but it helps us understand all that Dr. Luke wrote. Now, you may be familiar with our series, The Life of Jesus A.D. All of this year will be in the book of Acts. All of last year, we're in the book of Luke because Acts is Luke part two. It was written by the same doctor around the same time for the same purpose. The first part, Luke part one, is the life story of Jesus and actually ends with his ascension. It goes further than any of the 
Gospels do in many ways. And then um, the book of Luke part two, what we call Acts, overlaps that. We zoom in again in his ascension and goes all the way through the extended missionary journeys of Paul to the outer reaches of the Mediterranean. But I want to give you one more because they are beautifully linked together. After the birth narratives in the book of Luke last year, what we saw is Jesus' ministry beginning in Galilee up north. And he makes one journey, as he does in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to Jerusalem for the end, for the conclusion, to die on the cross. He makes one journey. John, in contrast, he has sees many journeys of Jesus to Jerusalem, which is, of course, what he would have done as a good Jew. But Luke has one. So he starts in Galilee, then he moves to Samaria, then he gets to Judea, and then he stays in Jerusalem and dies on the cross and is resurrected. And that's essentially where the gospel ends. But watch what Luke does for part two in the book of Acts, which we're studying. He starts in Jerusalem, and the whole point is it for it to expand back out to the remotest parts of the earth. And this is what Jesus says in chapter one of Acts, right? He tells his disciples, wait till I come and the Holy Spirit comes. So they're in Jerusalem. He says, you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest parts of the earth. So the gospel of Luke starts big and comes into Jerusalem, and the book of Acts starts in Jerusalem and goes out to the ends of the earth. Now, what spreads the gospel and the disciples, followers of Jesus out in the book of Acts? Well, a couple things. Obviously, the command of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that would be one and first. But second, a very, very unusual thing, something we might not have factored in, but something God has always used to move his people and to spread his word. What is that? Persecution, suffering, pain. That's how our text begins. Look again at verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen. This goes back to chapter 7 and chapter 8, where Stephen is the first Christian martyr of the New Testament. He sees the resurrected Jesus and they stone him to death. Standing at his death is a man named Saul who gives hearty approval. And Saul is breathing out threats and murder to the church. So these people uh, scattered make their way to Phoenicia, which is on the coast in the south, Cyprus, which is an island, Antioch, 350 miles north of Jerusalem, in modern-day, very southeastern Turkey, um, speaking the word of God to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to Greeks also, and the Lord was with them. And many, many people came to faith and believe in Jesus. So what sent the disciples out? Well, Jesus commanded them to go out, filled them with his spirit, but also it was persecution. It was suffering. It was pain. Let's talk about suffering for just a second. Even though many of us today, perhaps we aren't experiencing the same kind of persecution that we see in the New Testament or the same kind of persecution that we see today alive and well in the church and other parts of the world. In communist countries, in China, especially in North Korea, the most persecuted place for Christians to live on the earth. In Muslim countries, in Africa, even in South America, all parts of the world see some level of persecution. I would Submit to you that here in the West, we have it pretty good. We aren't afraid when we gather at church on Sunday mornings. We aren't afraid when we gather with small groups in our home to read the scriptures, to pray. But there are many Christians, I would say most of the Christians in the world, struggle under persecution and suffering. And that's not necessarily true of us in the West, in America, at least not yet. It may be coming but not now, not yet. But even though that may not be true, you still inevitably are experiencing suffering, some sort of conflict, friction. Some of it relates to your faith in Jesus, your following Jesus. Sometimes 
That puts you at odds with other family members, with extended family members, with your neighbors, with your coworkers. You believe something, you have certain values that Jesus shares, and that puts you at odds with him. Some of you here tuning in online or in the communion service, you're spiritually single, but you're married. You're married to someone who doesn't understand or believe in Jesus like you do. So you're spiritually single, but you're one flesh with another person. And that can be a very, very difficult life to live. Because you love and deeply love this other person, your spouse, but yet you don't have Jesus in common. So there are all kinds of elements of suffering and pain and persecution that we can experience on our level here. And I need you to know that when you experience that kind of suffering and more, things that are related to your faith or just things that are related to the corruption and fall of this earth, suffering is inevitable in many ways. And I need you to hear me as a pastor and friend. Inside of suffering, theology is very important. It may not make sense to you, but inside of suffering, theology is very, very important. Because as Simone Weil would say, pain and suffering make God appear to be absent. Pain and suffering make God appear to be absent. And many of you know exactly what she was saying. In the midst of infertility, the loss of a child, an unwanted separation from a spouse, all manner of other things, many times and often we hit our knees and pray to God and we hear crickets back because pain and suffering can make God appear to be absent. So theology inside of suffering is very important. I'll one-up that and say this, something I believe and am trying to walk in because I believe it's biblically true from the first pages of our scripture to the end, that the vitality and longevity of your ministry and calling in life, whatever it may be, will be determined by how you handle pain. It will be because pain is inevitable. And the great enemy of our God in heaven the accuser of the brethren, the liar and adversaries, a murderer from the beginning. He wants to take the pain and suffering in this world in whatever shape that it comes, and he wants to crush you with it. But God has, in his sovereign power, a different plan. You see, I want to share with you three things that I think we see in this text and in all of the scriptures. Suffering, first, can become a pulpit for you. Suffering can become a pulpit. I say can because this is not automatic. It doesn't happen necessarily. It can crush you, but suffering can also become a pulpit. What do I mean? It can give you a voice that you didn't have before. It can give you a platform in the lives of others that you didn't have before. Um, One of my heroes, she and her husband, Um, We love them dearly. I wish we were closer and spent more time together. Um, But my friend Carmen has had cancer and went through a long treatment and recovered and then had cancer again, went through a long treatment and recovered and now has cancer again. She has been through it. She's lived in the hospital for many, many long weeks and months. And I tell you, her vibrant faith and love of Jesus has given her something to say to the many, many scores of nurses and doctors that have come through her room. And when I went to sat with, sat with her in the room, I was the recipient of that. Even as her pastor, she blessed me and encouraged me because suffering has given her a voice that she didn't have before. And it painted her canvas with darker colors so that the light of Jesus could be in greater contrast. And oh, if we had those nurses and doctors here, they would all tell you the same thing I would tell you, is that suffering has made her better, and it has given her a voice, and it has blessed me. Suffering can become for you a pulpit. Suffering, I would say this, if you indulge the analogy, suffering can also become a passport for you. It can give you access to different stories and lives that you wouldn't have normally had access to. Uh, Suffering can become uh, a pulpit, but suffering can also become a passport. It can take you places. I can tell you that 
Up until that point in our lives, the early years of our marriage, Liza and I struggled with infertility. All she ever wanted to be was a mom. And when that didn't happen, month after month, year after year, and then we started to see the doctors and other doctors and other doctors, and they would always tell us, uh, it's not going to happen for you. That was incredibly painful, like the worst and most difficult thing that we had walked through up until that point. God gave us miraculously two beautiful children. The four of us are a team. We are the best together, and we love each other deeply. Um, And so God has answered our prayers, but I got to tell you, that suffering we wouldn't exchange for anything else because now we get to sit with people in the middle of infertility, and we don't give them trite, cliche platitudes. Those don't help by the way. It is not true that God won't give you more than you can handle. Not true. Not biblical. God often gives you more than you can handle because he wants you to rely on him and not your own strength. And so when we sit with people going through infertility, we just cry with them and we wait and we sit and we pray And we say, we know something of what you're going through. Not exactly, but something because we've walked this road. And that suffering has given us a passport into other lives. The same is true for you. It can become. It doesn't necessarily become, but it can. And finally, I would say that suffering can also become a pathway to Christ-likeness. We say we want to be like Jesus, but what exactly in the life of Jesus do we want to be like? Think about that with me. We want to be like Jesus. Oh, what part? Well, the, you know, like speaking well part and gathering the crowds. The healing would be cool. Um, Raise up somebody from the dead, take away infirmities, walking on water. That'd be a cool vacation trick. Like to be like Jesus in that area. What about your family thinking that you were crazy? What about being hunted by the religious leaders of the day? What about being kissed in betrayal by the guy who just hours before sat in the place of honor at a Passover meal? What about all your best friends at the moment you most needed them abandoning you? What about that part of Jesus? Let me ask you another question. Of all the suffering that Jesus engaged in his life ministry... How much of it was unjust? I would dare say all of it. So if you are going through unjust suffering, something you don't deserve, something that's not a consequence of your sin, it's not discipline from the Lord, it can become a pathway for you to be more like Jesus because that's what he went through. You see, God says to Satan in the fall of this world and the corruption of our flesh and all the things that the adversary and accuser and liar and murderer, our enemy, wants to do. He says, do your worst and then watch me in my sovereign power overturn it all and use it for good in the lives of my daughters and sons and in the lives of my church. Watch me. And that's the beauty of what God does. He can do it. It doesn't automatically happen. But suffering can become a pulpit and a passport and a pathway for you. But this is what God did with his church. And it's often the story of the church. At least it is in the book of Acts and the rest of the history of the Christian church on the earth. I don't know if you know this. But we don't do well in times of plenty. The church doesn't. We do well in times of great desperation. John Steinbeck, in a private letter It was published in the Washington Post in 1960, and part of that letter said this, a strange species we are. We can handle almost everything that God and nature throws at us, save only plenty. If I wanted to destroy a nation, I would give it far too much. And in short order, it would be on its knees, greedy and sick. If that's the truth of our nature, isn't it a grace that God uses times of persecution, suffering, and pain to steer us, to mature us, and to make us more like his son Jesus? Leslie Newbegin, in a 1977 book called The Good Shepherd, it's hard to find these days, he says, 
the church needs leaders. It's always need, needed leaders. But what kind of leaders? He says this, watch Jesus. Jesus gets up from his knees in prayer. And then he says to his disciples, rise up, let us go from here. And he leads them out to the cross. He said, that is the pattern of leadership that we need. Jesus' brand of leadership, who embraced the pain and suffering of this broken world in order to redeem it in your life. You see, we have to have a good theology of suffering in order to make it in this world. Otherwise, we'll feel like God is not omnipotent. He doesn't care, doesn't see us. No, he sees, he cares, he knows. Suffering is really important. And we have a long list of men and women who went before us. Job, Joseph, Daniel, and his friends. What about Esther and Mordecai? What about Isaiah, the 40-year prophet who not many people listen to? What about any of the other writing prophets? Jesus, Peter, John, we see it in the book of Acts. In chapter 4, Peter and John are in prison. In chapter 5, Peter and John are in prison. And then they're released but flogged. In chapter 5, verse 40, they were flogged and then released. And they released back to the church. And it says that Peter and John rejoiced because they were counted worthy to share in the shame that Jesus shared in. Stephen was the original martyr of the Christian era in chapter 7. Chapter 8, we see Saul breathing out murder and threats. In chapter 9, he's seeking the church. He meets Jesus. And then immediately after, he's the target of persecution. And it will continue for the rest of the book. In fact, one of the most chilling statements is in Acts chapter 9, verse 16. God speaks. Jesus speaks to Saul, the former persecutor of the church, now believer in him, through Ananias. This is what it says. I will show him, chapter 9, verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. If Jesus suffered and we want to be like Jesus, that will be part of our experience. And the Father will turn it and redeem it and beautify it in our lives and the lives of others. Suffering requires a good theology. We have a long list of saints that have gone before us. Just read Hebrews chapter 11, right? And then you get to chapter 12. Therefore, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and pioneer of our faith, throwing off every sin that so easily entangles and all the things that hinder us, so that we can run. And then verse three, remember him who suffered such hostility at the hands of evil sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart when you suffer. James chapter one, I hate that verse, don't you? Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you face various trials. I'm like, nah, I don't think so. (laughs) What? Why? Because we know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and endurance. And endurance, having its way, makes you complete, lacking nothing. You see, there's a point in it all. God's sovereignty has a point in it all. First Peter, a whole book written to sufferers, chapter 2 says this, for, and coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men. Never forget that about Jesus, that he was rejected by men. Coming to him as a living stone that has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up in a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Never forget the way that Jesus walked before us. This is the first part of our passage. It says that, hey, the church started to go north to Antioch. This is a brand new city that we've seen in the book of Acts, and it will become, after the mother church in Jerusalem, the single most important city. It was also the third largest city in the Roman Empire. After Rome and Alexandria Alexandria and Egypt, Antioch was the largest city. It was built on a river basin that fed into the Mediterranean. It was a perfect strategic spot for land and sea travel. It was massive. 
And this is where the church is first called Christians in Antioch which means those who are associated with Jesus, those who identify with Jesus, little Christs. Our identity as followers of Jesus is somehow linked all the way back to this important city. As we continue in the book of Acts, and I encourage you to read it, it's absolutely gorgeous. Read it on your own. As we continue, you'll notice that the three missionary journeys of Paul begin and end in Antioch. It's the home base, the sending church. It's brilliant. And we renew a friendship here in our text that we saw before. Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 22. The news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. It would have taken him almost two weeks or more to travel from Jerusalem to there, 350 miles. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced began to encourage them with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Let me tell you something about Barnabas and why I love him so very much. Barnabas isn't even really his name. Pastor Ken told us that a few weeks ago when he was teaching in chapter 9. His name is Joseph. Barnabas is a nickname. It has nothing to do with his real name because Barnabas means son of encouragement. And this man was so encouraging, so generous and sacrificial, he sold a big plot of land, gave all the money to the church, so full of faith, so full of the Holy Spirit, he is, I need to show this with you, he is the guy in the corner of almost every New Testament picture. I'll show you. Do you know who wrote more words of the New Testament than any other person? Think about it just for a second. If you answered Paul, you'd be wrong. It's Luke. Luke with the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts together for word count is more than all the 13 books of Paul. So Luke wrote the most of the New Testament. Paul's very, very close, but Luke wrote more. But we also know and have seen and we'll see again that Barnabas has a cousin. He's friends with Paul and he goes on missionary journeys with Paul, right? He's associated with the apostles and Peter, He also has a cousin named John Mark, whose relationship with Peter ends up for us with the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark is Peter's gospel written through John Mark. So who is the glue holding all of these people together? It's Barnabas. Barnabas is the one who introduces Saul to the rest of the apostles and really sets up his ministry. He's the one that connects John Mark to Paul. He connects the apostles, Peter, to Paul. Barnabas is behind all of the letters of Paul. He's behind the gospel of Mark, which makes him the most important, invisible person in the New Testament after Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? That's why I love Barnabas, because he is invisible and he accepts it. I got to tell you, of all the things that the church needs now, we need a lot of things. We need more women and men in the spirit of Barnabas who are okay being invisible behind the scenes. No attention addicts, glory seekers, glittering images on the stage, gathering crowds, enjoying all of the clamor, and then being a different person behind the scenes. Far too much of that over the past many decades. Far too much of that even today. We need more Barnabases. We need more glad Barnabases and reluctant Pauls who have the spotlight but don't want it. We need more men and women like that, and that's why I love Barnabas so much. The end of this passage gives us a little clue to something that will become a subtext for the rest of the story of Acts, and that is this great famine that happens in Jerusalem and Judea. The mother church is in need of relief, and Paul and Barnabas go out. And if you connect all the passages, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Galatians chapter 2, even at the end of Acts chapter 24, verse 17, he's going out and asking churches to generously and sacrificially give, and he's taking that money back very carefully and righteously and bringing it back to the church in Jerusalem. And it all starts here with the prophecy of Agabus. So putting all of this together... In one big idea, here's what I would say. It's a little rough, but I want this to hang in your heart a little bit. 
the body of Christ must walk like her head walks. The body of Christ must walk like her head. And this is what I mean. We're called the body of Christ on the earth. Jesus Christ is our head, and he walked the road of suffering. He walked the road of spotlight, and men like Barnabas and others got out of the way as to not obstruct anyone's view of Jesus, our head. And of course, Jesus met needs like they did. You see, not just pretending, but actually being like Jesus, the body of Christ must walk as he did. And that includes suffering. That includes meeting needs. That is the jewel of this text, in my opinion. As a missionary text scattering out, I love missionary stories, especially of the modern church, of recent church history. They make my heart erupt with joy. When I see the grace of God, the spirit of God, the gospel of God go out into dark places. Like A.W. Milne. No one would ever know that name. But a long time ago, he felt God call him to the Hebrides Archipelago. We know that as Vanuatu. Way out in the middle of nowhere between Fiji and Papua New Guinea. Listen, every other missionary that went before A.W. Milne to Vanuatu was killed. But he felt God call and he went. His ministry lasted 35 years. And when he died, they buried him in the middle of the village with this inscription. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Isn't that beautiful? That's what we get to experience when we follow God in the path that Jesus walked. I'll tell you about David and Svea Flood, who were called to the Congo over 100 years ago. David and Svea Flood served in the Congo, a hard place. Svea became pregnant, couldn't leave the house, couldn't go into the mission field with David. And so the only person she really got to talk to was the little boy who delivered eggs to the back door every day. And she would share Jesus with him. Unfortunately, when she gave birth to their daughter, Ana, she became very sick and died. Her husband, David, his mind and spirit crumbled under the weight of his wife's death. He couldn't care for his daughter. She was adopted by another missionary family called the Ericsons. They were poisoned by the locals. So she got adopted by yet a second family called the Bergs, Arthur and Anna. They changed her name to Agnes. She grew up in health, eventually came back to the United States, went to school, met and married and had a family, and was there for more than 30 years before she felt the urge to go over to London in the 1960s for a Pentecostal church conference. She heard one of the speakers. His name, Ruhagita Ndegora. He was the superintendent of all the Pentecostal church in Zaire. And she was captured because he lived at one time in the same village that her parents lived. So after he spoke, young Agnes goes to meet Ruhagita and she says, "Um, you were in this village in the Congo. Do you remember a family named the Floods? And he says through a translator, yes, I do. I, I delivered eggs to their house every day. And I remembered the woman. She was so kind. She shared Jesus with me. I'm not sure if she had any other convert in all of the Congo but me, but I believed. And then I remembered that she gave birth to a young girl and died. And I never heard from the young girl or the husband again. And she said, I am that young girl. And they wept together. And he says this. He says, right before I traveled to this conference, I went to your mother's grave and I laid flowers, thanking her on behalf, listen, thanking her on behalf of the hundreds of churches and thousands of believers that have come from her testimony. You see, when we walk in the pain and suffering of Jesus, in our own pain and suffering, the path of the cross, the cruciform life, If you want to have a great life, let it be the form of the cross. Cruciform means the form of the cross, the form of Jesus. When we walk in the cruciform life, we also get to participate in the resurrected life. 
and it comes through us. It comes through us. That's the path and the attitude and the power that Jesus wants for his church and that he wants for you. Let me pray for you. Father, we bless you. Oh, we thank you that suffering, pain, persecution is not too big of a mountain for you to move. It's not too big of a poison for you to remove, but you use it. You hate it, but you use it and turn it in our lives, in the lives of others. You give us a pulpit and a passport and a pathway, and you accept invisible servants who stand behind the scenes. You love it, and we love that about you. We bless you. We bless you. Help us meet needs and do all the things that you have for us in the glory of your spirit. We love you. We thank you. I pray blessing on everyone tuning in, everyone in the communion service, and everyone here. In answer to the prayer that we started out with, that we would leave here more like your son Jesus than we came in. That's still our prayer. God, make it so in us. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.